Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm very happy to have Jing Wang with us today. Hey, Jing. Hi. Hi there. Where are you located at? I'm in Beijing. Beijing. We are uh, halfway across the world. So we're on two opposite sides here. And that's really great. Um, what, is, what is your position there in, in Beijing? Are you at the Kabul Institute or something? Yeah, I'm an assistant professor in Kaolin Institute, uh, located in Peking University. Mm -hmm. Very good. Nice. Uh, let's see. Still China, still Northern Hemisphere. So how is the how's the summer in uh, Beijing? Uh, it's not a very hot summer, not as usual. This year we have a lot of rain mm -hmm. and caused some accident. Uh, so the weather is relatively cool. And it is like uh, around the 30 degrees, not too much, it does not go to 35. Mm -hmm. And uh, overall, it's a cool summer. How about your side? Is that very hot? hot? hot very hot. <laughs> so I'm in Phoenix. Uh, so we're in a desert. Uh, and today, today was a little bit cooler. We probably got up to maybe 40 C today. Um, so yesterday, we were up around a little hotter, a little 42, 43 C. Um, so it gets it gets good and toasty, um, hot in Phoenix. Um, the summer is also the wet season in Phoenix. So although it uh, this is when we get our rains, we get our thunderstorms, we get our lightning. Um, so it's it's uh, the humidity is up in the summer in Phoenix, uh, and that usually happens in July and August. And then most of the other time, the humidity is it's quite dry. Um, the humidity is down in single digits, right? 10%, 8%, 1% in the winter. Um, but yeah, summer is when we, we get our rains. But so far, it's going okay on this my August 5th, uh, Thursday, and I believe it's your morning in August 6th. Um, we're making it work. Very cool. Jing, what do you like to do for research? Uh, I work on galaxy evolution mm -hmm. uh, and uh, particularly focused on the link, a role that the uh, atomic hydrogen gas uh -huh. um, plays in the evolution of galaxies on different aspects, uh, like the um, galaxies, how it forms its disky structures, like spiral arms, bars, uh, and how uh, the galaxies evolve in different environments, like clusters, groups. Uh, and how the star formation in different locations with galaxies in the outskirts, in the warp, in the inner disk is sustained. Cool. Very nice. Awesome. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ article, Wallaby Pilot Survey, the diversity of RAM pressure stripping of the galactic H1 gas in the hydro cluster. And Jing, take us away. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, among first paper of the pilot survey of Wallaby. Uh, and Wallaby is one among the two ongoing key surveys at ASCAP. Mm. And the ASCAP is the SK Pathfinder in Australia, uh, which is uh, uh, together with Meerkat uh, and MWA to be at experimental arrays for the SK in the future. Um, and uh, among those many surveys conducted at the same time uh, in those on those SK pathfinders, the key feature of Wallaby is that uh, it has a very uh, wide survey area. Uh, it plans to survey two thirds of the whole sky, uh, but uh, in the end, we will see uh, uh, the how it will get a balance between the survey speed, the data conduct data reduction speed uh, and the time needed to complete them. Uh, but uh, our, uh, we, we guess at least they will uh, complete the southern scale where the telescope is located at. Cool. Uh, yeah, it is able to survey so large a sky because it has a, it is a telescope that with the fastest survey speed uh, ever, it has a 30 square degree uh, field of view so with one snapshot, you capture really a large area. Yeah, um, very nice. And that's why, that's also one of the reasons why we uh, use this hydro cluster as one of the three uh, pilot survey targets 
yeah. which is present in this paper. Uh, one good thing with the hydro cluster is that it is uh, at, 20, at 200 with a radius, uh, it's exactly around uh, between one half and uh, one third of the half width of the field of view. So okay. that with one snapshot, we mm. cover the whole thing, whole system Very out cool. to over twice the wear radius. Yeah. And we're going to see all that is happening within the cluster, including those galaxies uh, that are right in falling into the cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we also to see how everything that is, every environmental effects, including the run pressure stripping, tidal stripping, that is ongoing in the cluster at a consistent um, level of detection limit and the resolution. Okay, great. Mm. And uh, yeah, by, by saying this, I would like to uh, go to figure one. So it, uh, it exactly shows what I talked about, the whole field of view uh, of the hydro cluster. Oh, that's such a lovely figure, okay. Yeah, we love this figure that we're holding, love this figure. Yeah, okay. before I go ahead, I need to say uh, this work, as you already saw from the author list, so the author list is very long. And so the, this work is really built up on the effort, the work of a very large team who worked on the data reduction, on the data quality quantification, uh, and on, on source funding, and on any, any other things. Mm -hmm. So it's not an effort out of my self alone, it's really the, the, the fruit of the products of a whole thing. Uh, I was uh, very lucky to be able to, able to lead this first study conducting the science exploration with the data. All yeah. right, there's a shout out to all the co-authors, very good. All right, let's go back to you, Hydra cluster, here we go. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, right now, yeah, right now I said why uh, it is a perfect field for all of you to look at, but there is also a scientific reason why, why we want all of you to take a look at this cluster. Uh, before uh, this hydro cluster was uh, was was cameraed by all of you, uh, the other two major clusters, massive clusters with a mass about 10 to the 14, uh, 10 to the 14 stellar mass, mm -hmm. uh, or solar mass, sorry, uh, was uh, were meaning the Virgo cluster in the very nearby universe and the coma cluster a bit mm -hmm. further away. Um, and uh, the cluster, these clusters, Virgo and the coma, they were studied extensively because they were nearby and we can see the details. And particularly when we want to know the distribution of the gas, the neutral hydrogen H1 <laughs> gas, and the, 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 we need it to be nearby because the typical resolution, angular resolution of radio telescopes at 21 centimeter uh, is typically uh, much lower than those in the optical. Mm -hmm. uh, up to now, the typical resolution uh, we, we use, uh, the best resolution is around the six to eight arc seconds. Uh, and those usually comes from the uh, most uh, extended configurations at WLA and at GMRT. Um, but uh, the, the, the limitation with radio, one of the limitation with the radio observations is that if we want to have very high resolution, mm -hmm. then we, uh, we have to uh, sacrifice the sensitivity and survey speed. And uh, this is because two, two reasons. One is that for interferometry, uh, the, the interferometry is the only way to get the high resolution maps. Mm -hmm. And in order for, in, for interferometry to cover uh, enough of the uh, the image details uh, we really we call it to cover enough the UV plane uh, by mm -hmm. when the gas when the Earth is rotating uh, and then the the baseline of the uh, telescope arrays they will cover the different parts of the sky and they cover the different uh, spatial frequency uh, of the of the information 
Uh, and uh, so, so by doing that, we usually typically lead at least uh, and, uh, one day to uh, or half day to cover uh, the, the fully cover a uh, sky region uh, okay. with the uh, Eastern Western Array, which is uh, one of the uh, most popular old configuration radio antennas. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and need also um, like six hours for the VLA and then many hours for other uh, telescopes of more complex configurations. Uh, this is a by the, this is a due to the nature of interferometry observation. And also because the hydrogen H1 is come from the forbidden line, the, the, the sensitivity, the, 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 the line, the emission line is quite, uh, quite thin. So it is it needs a lot of exposure time to detect it. Uh, so as a result, either we can only have a high resolution, but a very low sensitivity with inter interferometry, or we have very relatively higher sensitivity, but a very low uh, resolution uh, with the other type of observation that is a single dish. Uh, single dish usually have larger apertures, so higher sensitivity, but the single dish, they have much lower resolution. But uh, uh, even for single dish, we have to limit it to very uh, low redshift because I said the H1 is a very faint line. So because of these reasons, the past uh, H1 studies of uh, clusters groups has to be limited to the local universe, mostly below uh, 100 megaparsec. Yeah. Coma is a uh, kind of like the uh, among the high uh, redshift in H1 radio astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was uh, very hard to obtain high resolution and high sensitivity at the same time, even for low redshift observations. Uh, and so with the, the past observations, past studies for Virgo and for Coma, uh, we either only have the single dish uh, irreversible um, catalog for those two clusters that only have the total flux for each galaxy. We don't have much resolution there. Or we only can do targeted survey for a few selected galaxies. So we don't cover the, all the members, all the gas rich members of the group. Uh, but this with Wallaby now for the uh, for almost for the first time we are able to uh, capture the uh, nearly one hundred members uh, in the group out to a few times the wearer radius mm -hmm. uh, with a, and with a moderate resolution and as well I will show uh, we we resolve the H one in around thirty galaxies in this group in this cluster and uh, so this is the one of the um, one of the technical major reasons we need to observe a cluster, need to observe a hydro cluster. And the scientific reason we need to observe it, there are also scientific, scientific reasons. And that is that uh, in order to study how, uh, how the galaxies evolve in a cluster, we need to consider its cosmological context. That is the, the satellite galaxies of the cluster they need to continuously info from the uh, from the surroundings, either through the filament or from the void. Uh, they so they come in when they come into the cluster. They they have different conditions, and when they have different conditions, well, I, I, um, they have different stellar distribution. They have different H one distribution, uh, and as as a result, these different conditions set the different paths of evolution or being affected by environmental effects when these galaxies info into the clusters. And uh, so this is the science reason why we need a large field of view and uh, for sensors of the uh, of the informing gas rich satellites. Uh, and uh, yeah and when talking about this uh, Infoiling satellites and satellites in a cluster. One of the previous uh, uh, the problem uh, for studying these type of galaxies is very hard to distinguish between nature or nurture uh, scenario. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By saying this, yeah. it means that. Yep. By saying this, we mean that when we observe uh, older. Uh, gas pool population in the cluster, it's very hard to tell 
whether they were all there because they were assembled in the cluster very long ago, or they were uh, processed severely by the harsh environmental effects during the info. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and uh, when we use uh, this H1 survey, this H1 selected sample, what kind of uh, go around the problem uh, escaped from that very hard problem because these galaxies, they are gas rich. Uh, and since the environmental effects, they are so strong, so environment is so harsh, uh, these gas rich galaxies, they must be infalling recently. It's uh, very likely the majority of them infall for the first time. Okay. And we will also see this later from, from the phase space diagram of the cluster. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, I think I stay on this figure for, for quite a long now, but uh, I give a background, so Lovely. I'm happy to move on. <laughs> it's lovely. Do you want me to move on or do you want to stay on this figure? Yeah, we move on, please. Move on. Okay. Uh, then we have some definition of how we're going to strip, and we got some radial measurements here. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow. Well, yeah. Uh, one of the, the major goal of this paper is to study the room pressure stripping in this cluster. Uh, in a cluster, we expect the many different processes to ongoing, including the gravitational effects, uh, the, the galaxy uh, affected by the harassment effects of su surrounding satellites when it move very fast through them. And it is totally also affected by the gravitational potential of the cluster because the cluster is uh, the dark matter halo is very massive and it's uh, a few times 10 to the 14. Uh, and also hydrodynamically it also affected by other effects like the viscous stripping, viscosity stripping and like the evaporation because the intercluster medium is very hot. It's 10 to the six Kelvin. Um, but uh, in the study, we focus on uh, the, the run pressure stripping. One of the questions I, typically, I often receive from other people is that, how will you distinguish, how will you disentangle these different effects? Right. Since so many things are ongoing. So uh, the way we, 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 we separated this in, in uh, run pressure effects out is to rely on um, theoretical models, theoretical predictions. Okay. Theoretically, what type of galaxies most likely affected by run pressure stripping? Uh, so uh, we used the very old model of um, uh, we uh, we use a very old model of uh, uh, sorry, it's a uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, good. I must be very nervous, so I forgot the name. I was so familiar with the name. We saw the seven, 1970s. Some paper, could we go back to the last yeah, page? Yeah, I was just going to say, it must, be, it must be in here. Oh, Gun and God, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gun and God, yes, Gun of God, course. Yeah. I, I say this name so many times. <laughs> and yet, I forgot it. <laughs> Otherwise, I was very too excited. <laughs> anyway. Oh, yeah, it's the Gun and God model, uh -huh, sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Gun gun model. Yeah, we we yeah. use a modified form format of that model because in the original model it only considered the anchoring force from the stars, the gravitational uh, potential of the stars. But in this study, uh, we also take into account uh, the self gravity of the H one gas. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing this as we we are show later because we we will consider and one of the most important reason we have the results in this paper is that the H1 disks, they extend much further than the stellar disk uh, in yeah. the very outer region. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, it is really the H1 self-gravity that uh, anchors itself on the disk plane. The stellar component, it has a very small fraction of the bionic mass there. Mm. And so we, we use that model and we compare it with the run pressure network a galaxy suffer at a location in the cluster. Uh, and then we quantify the, uh, the fraction of H1 uh, that could be uh, stripped uh, 
by saying that I mean, uh, when we consider the image of the galaxy, we, we have a lot of pixels. We calculate the anchoring force in each pixel. And if in that pixel, the anchoring force is lower than the room pressure, then we consider it as a candidate pixel that can be stripped by H1. Okay. And that okay. portion, or, or stripped by room pressure, and that portion uh, is called the strippable H1. So with this model rate resolution or Wallaby, uh, we, we, we were able to uh, quantify how much of the H1 is strippable for at least the resolved galaxies. Uh, and as I said, the resolution is only moderate, uh, it's 30 arc second. Uh, it's uh, not the best resolution we can achieve today uh, at like well, 8 arc second, 6 arc second, like at uh, Milcat. But uh, we, you, you, the advantage of this telescope is the survey speed, and we have have moderate resolution for us to uh, to to have resolution for for the best resolved galaxies, and that's those uh, listed in uh, the the results listed in this figure two. Hmm. And it turned out very important to have the moderate resolution to resolve those twenty seven galaxies, hmm. uh, because. Uh, we are going to use this as a test sample, a reference sample, to justify our method, which I will introduce later, to quantify the run pressure stripping effects in the less resolved galaxies. It turned out that this, this test uh, is very important uh, because uh, the, the using those unresolved galaxies is not that straightforward. Um, and uh, uh, here in the figure, uh, in the panel A and the panel B, I uh, plotted uh, the, uh, some classical things we would show with H1 images of galaxies. One is a size mass relation, uh, and the size is defined one, at one solar mass per PC square surface density, and the mass is the total H1 mass. Uh, and it's uh, known for quite a long time that over a very large uh, mass range, uh, from uh, around 10 to 6 for Leo T in the local group to the most massive, most H1 massive galaxies, which would have a mass of 10 to 11, uh, the galaxies, majority of the galaxies uh, obey that very tight size mass relation uh, with a scatter of only 14% uh, in the direction of, of the radius or 0.06 dex if we're calculating the logarithm space. Okay. Uh, it is actually a mysterious why the galaxies, uh, different types, the over so large a range of mass that obey this relation. But, uh, uh, but uh, here we are not going to investigate that. Uh, we, instead, since galaxies obey such a tight relation, we will make use of it. Uh, and yep. uh, it will be useful for those unresolved galaxies. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, then panel B, we plotted the surface density of H1 as a function uh, of radius. We plotted this because in, in my earlier studies and some other uh, earlier studies, it was found that if we normalize the radial surface density profile of H1 by the RH1 uh, in the size mass relation, that is one solar mass per PC square surface density radius, right. and then the outer regions of the uh, H1 disks, uh, they look very self-similar. They exponentially uh, drop in as a function radius. And uh, most importantly, the scale length is almost uh, the same. Uh, like around the scale length is around the uh, one fifth of the RH1 characteristic radius. Mm -hmm. And that's for typical galaxies, including dwarf galaxies and uh, spiral galaxies. Uh, but here, uh, when we look at it, this, this hydro member galaxies, they seem, they show a hint to divide from the relation around the RH1, around the, uh, the, the, the point where all the profiles, they intersect with each other. Right. They, it is harder to draw a conclusion. They have self-similar disk from this figure. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, as, yeah, and uh, as we, we showed in panel A, they, they, they still obey the same size mass relation as other galaxies. Right. Uh, so when they tend to divide from the median profile, 
uh, of other galaxies, which is the gray curve in this figure. Uh, the reason they still lie on the same size mass relation is they seem to, they tend to have higher density on the outer region and the slightly lower density in the inner region. Uh, the, the, the higher out density in the outer region seem to be linked to the uh, effect that they may be perturbed by the environment. So they tend to have uh, lopy sided tails uh, in the outer region, in the outer region. Well, in the inner region, uh, the, as, a, uh, as a result of combination of environmental effects and the gas consumption, they tend to have a lower density in the inner disk. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is, the, what is the green dash line? Uh, this green dash line mark the uh, the detection limit in substantiality we expect from uh, Wallaby. Okay. And this, but we do not directly compare. Uh, this is a uh, this is a guiding line so that the substantiality below that is less trustful. But for some of the uh, uh, for, but for some of the galaxies, the the profiles extend below that because the prof when do the profile we do it as a muscle average. So okay. if there is a tail, uh, and they 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 could uh, they could go below that. Sure. Okay. Got it. Yeah, but uh, still, even when they below that, they they show a hint of uh, be above the the gray curve, which is the medium profile of galaxies. Yeah. Uh, and this turned out to be important for our uh, for our uh, application, our quantification of run pressure strengths in the galaxy. Uh, as I, we just said, we use we are going to use a gas a a model to quantify run pressure strippable gas uh, in a galaxy, and that is no problem for a resolved uh, galaxy. Uh, but how will we do that for unresolved galaxy? And that will be shown in the next figure. That is the figure three. Let's go to figure three. Yeah. Yeah. Distribution. In phase space. Oh, we got some big ones here. Okay. Back that off a little bit. Ah, oh, so it should be figure four. <laughs> we figure we come four. Back to, yeah, yeah, we come back to this figure three later. That's fine. Uh, All mm -hmm. right. Figure four. Yeah. Uh, the procedure. Okay. Yeah. This is how we're going to do for the unresolved galaxies because in the cluster, uh, within uh, 2.5 times the river radius, we detect. Uh, uh, nearly 90 usable galaxies, um, but uh, uh, only 27 of them are resolved. For the rest, uh, over two thirds of them, they are unresolved. Right. Uh, and uh, we're going to use some of the um, some of the uh, rules that is H1 distribution would obey to help us quantify the run pressure stripping level in these unresolved galaxies. We're going to use a size mass relation uh, as we should um, before we mm. use the H1 mass in addition size mass relation to predict the H1 size. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we combine the H1 size with the median profile uh, of H1 subject density as a function of R over RH1 to predict the mm -hmm. overall uh, radial distribution of H1. Yeah. Uh, and then we combine this predicted H1 profile with a stellar subject density profile uh, so we get the anchoring force of the galaxy through yeah. the gun, 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 gun model. Got it. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And then we can combine, uh, compare this profile of anchoring force level to the run pressure level uh, so that we get a characteristic radius at RPS. Yes, thanks. Uh -huh. So below, uh, below that, uh, uh, when the anchoring force is below the purple line, when the radius is beyond that RPS, that is a strip of proportion of the H1 disk. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we accumulate the H1 mass within that part, uh, and then we get the H1 mass that is strippable. Uh, and then we get the fraction of the H1 mass that is strippable. One, that is one of the key parameters going to be used in this paper, the FRPS fraction of strippable H1 over the total amount of H1. Okay. And, and so this is how we're going to do with the unresolved galaxies. And as we said, the resolved galaxies the profile, they divide a bit from the medium profile. Mm -hmm. So that cost uh, 
correction factor of around 1.4 for us to be multiplied to the, uh, the originally calculated FS RPS per day uh, to, to get a predicted value matched with the, the real value, uh, the, the real value. We do such calibration with those resolved galaxies. Uh, and uh, uh, such, a, um, such a calibration is illustrate, illustrated in the panel C of figure two, uh, where we compared the predicted FRPS with the real uh, FRPS of those resolved uh, run pressure stripping galaxies. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. after, mm -hmm. yeah. And only after that correction, uh, we, we remove a systematic, systematic difference uh, between the two quantities, the predicted value and the real value. Uh, and so uh, now they, they now, so with this uh, predicted FRPS, we'll be able to uh, study the statistical properties of the run pressure stripping affected galaxies within the cluster. Yep, I'm with you. Uh, and then now we can go to figure three, Jeez. where is the face space diagram of the cluster. Very good. Uh, okay. Yeah, we will only focus on the bottom panel. Okay. Um, the the face space diagram is the offset uh, of velocity, uh, radial velocity with respect to the cluster center, okay. normalized by the velocity dispersion of the cluster, mm -hmm. uh, and the other function of radius, the projected distance of galaxies uh, to the cluster center, normalized by uh, the R200, that is the visual radius. Mm -hmm. So this diagram uh, has been used in the literature to, to, to illustrate in the, the info process of a satellite uh, into the cluster. Okay. Uh, I, draw, I draw several curves here. Uh, firstly, the, the, the Mm, yeah, the, this uh, yeah this this triangle it defines the visual light roughly defines the visualized region where most of the visualized satellites would lie. Uh, so we expect that most of the galaxies there would be uh, staying in the cluster for at least four giga years after one orbit or four orbit in the in the cluster, right. and then they they will tend to be uh, old gas pool yes. and. Uh, and indeed, we, we don't see uh, many of many galaxies there, at least to avoid the, the bottom half of this triangle. Okay, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and uh, we also have two uh, curves there. Uh, the lower curve is, uh, uh, is the projection average escaping, will escape velocity of the cluster. Uh, so uh, it affects the, we can see the rising toward the cluster center, reflecting the fact that galaxies, uh, they got the gravitational potential transferred to the, uh, transferred to the kinematic energy during the info get accelerated. Yep. Uh, and this is the project, projection effect uh, average, the meaning that uh, in the y axis, we, we, we only observe the radial velocity, but the physical need should be uh, the, 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 the total velocity, the, uh, the direction average of the velocity that matters when calculating the kinematic energy. Yeah. Uh, and also in the x axis, we observe the projected distance from the cluster center, but the physical need should be the, the real distance, three dimensional distance from the cluster center uh, that matters. So here it is like a, a statistical curve of the velo with escape velocity. Uh, statistical average the curve is a projection effect average the curve. And the final, the dotted curve is a maximum uh, escape velocity. Uh, if we, uh, we, we say the radial velocity distance uh, is, the is the real velocity distance from the cluster center, and uh, that is a maximum uh, escape uh, curve would uh, would lie, okay. uh, uh, and in uh, and in this in this diagram, uh, we we can see the two uh, two things. First one is our technique uh, was successful. Uh, we used uh, the uh, 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 we used a method to quantify the run pressure stripping level in unresolved galaxies. 
uh, and we show that for the resolved galaxies, the FRPS matches. Mm -hmm. And here uh, we're going to see whether our identification, uh, whether they are stripped by run pressure or not, uh, is correct. And so we compare those um, crosses with those dots. Mm -hmm. uh, and those, uh, the, the, those, those crosses uh, and the, or the Y symbols, they are the run pressure stripping candidates right. um, identified from the images. Right. Uh, when it is unresolved, we use the, the peak dense, peak surface density of an image. So that only give a rough estimate of the status of stripping mm -hmm. because the peak surface density usually happening in the very center of the galaxy with the highest uh, anchoring force level Although it has the beam smearing effects there that would lower the H1 surface density a bit, but overall it's the surface density of the star that dominated the anchoring force there. Mm -hmm. So by using the peak surface density for the unresolved sources, and it is, uh, 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 the, it is identifying the strongest stripped galaxies. For unresolved sources, we're going to miss those mildly stripped sources. Uh, but, uh, when we, but when we compare those dots with those crosses or Y symbols, mm -hmm. we can see all the red crosses and Y symbols that are successfully identified by the unresolved, uh, the, 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 the Azimuthoni average method. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. the red dots, we call them the R1 RPS because we use the characteristic radius RH1 um, to help identify the run pressure stripping status. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, we also use image to help us identify those, uh, the, the, the rest, uh, uh, we, we can identify the non-run pressure stripping galaxies. Uh, those are blue marks, yep. Uh, yep. Yep. And, yeah, blue, blue crosses. And we also, uh, we also use our Azimuth on the average method uh, to correctly identify them. Uh, there are a lot of blue marks that without uh, without uh, uh, crosses or Y marks, those are the unresolved galaxies that uh, they, they are not identified to be run pressure stripping. Uh, uh, they are not resolved, but when they are unresolved, their peak substantiality uh, also uh, does not uh, does not guarantee its identification to be a very strong run pressure stripping. As we just said, for unresolved sources, we only to go in to identify the uh, strongly run pressure stripping sources from the images because we use the peak densities. If the peak densities say it's uh, we are not uh, it's not a run pressure stripping affected, we are go not going to know whether the peak source. Um, um, outside of the peaks of density uh, pixel will be affected by run pressure stripping or not because they are unresolved. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, those dots without blue dots without uh, crosses or Y marks. Right. Yeah. How about this point here, which is uh, a red circle with a blue cross? Uh, yeah, that's the only one misidentification. Uh, right. This galaxy, the image says uh, in run pressure unaffected source, but our as most only average method says her run pressure uh, affected. And when looking at this, luckily this is a run pressure, it's a resolved source. So looking at the image, we can find the source. Uh, it has a very strong bar and a very strong uh, spiral arm and the H1 tend to follow the optical bar mm -hmm. uh, and a strong uh, a spiral arm shape. As a result, those non-axis metric structures tend to strongly uh, uh, channel those gas into the inner disk uh, because it has a torque force uh, mm -hmm. on, on the gas outside uh, mm -hmm. in the relatively outer region of the disk. Okay. Uh, and okay. as a result, this galaxy divide from the, uh, the size mass relation of typical galaxies and divide from and the, the average of the profile of typical galaxies. So this one is the only misidentification here. So we think the, the success rate is actually quite satisfactory. Very good. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, so this, this, this shows the success of the method. And uh, now I'm going to point out the uh, science 
science result we're going to draw from this figure three. Sorry, it's still figure three. It's okay. I, will, I, I promise I will be faster no, later. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I just, my finger hit my mouse and it moved without my intention. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the sign, the, the, the first thing we see the round pressure stripping galaxy, the red dots, they, they, they separate well in the space space diagram from those blue dots. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is not a real scientific result, it's by construction because we use a run pressure compared with the anchoring force and run pressure level, it depends on the ICM density in the cluster. Mm -hmm. That would depend on the project distance from the cluster center. And uh, uh, the, uh, the run pressure never depend on the relative velocity of a galaxy move in within the intercluster median. That is the uh, y-axis, uh, the, the, the offset of velocity from the cluster center. So by construction, the galaxies on the top left side would have higher run pressure. So they tend to be uh, those run pressure stripped galaxies. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, by the point, uh, the, the, the interesting science conclusion we can draw from here is that mm, the, the run pressure strip, stripping affected galaxies, they extend very far. They extend beyond the viral radius. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are a large fraction of the galaxies within 1.5 times the viral radius. If we count within 1.35 times the viral radius, 75% of the satellites are run pressure stripping candidates. Okay. It's a quite high ratio from, and was not known before from the H1 perspective. Okay. It was not known before simply because uh, we didn't have images to resolve the H1 density in the galaxy. Uh, and uh, we didn't use a, uh, uh, observationally motivated H1 substantiality model uh, to, to, to quantify the, the H1 distribution compared to that run pressure stripping level for unresolved sources. Mm -hmm. So these are the two, 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 two things, with two interesting things we can draw from this figure. It uh, implies that the, the, run, the galaxies during the info, uh, it, it is a very strong evidence that galaxies during their info, they could be affected by run pressure stripping for a very long, uh, for a very long time. Oh. Uh, and if we uh, assume that on average, the galaxies travel with a speed of the velocity dispersion in the cluster, okay. uh, it took uh, two, over two giga years uh, for the galaxy to travel from the edge of the cluster toward the pericenter. So yes. that's, uh, that will be, so means uh, the run pressure stripping will be accompany the galaxy for a long time if the run pressure stripping uh, is not a very uh, uh, sh short process, it's not a very short period of time process. Yeah. Uh, uh, and now we, uh, so we, now we, we, we can go Go forward to the to figure five, I think. Uh, four already. That was the process, and then we got five. Let me back this down a little bit first. I'll zoom in as need be. Okay. Thank uh, you. Each one still a mouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and there are four panels, and, and but, but to make a, uh, a, a continuous story, I will only focus on the bottom two panels. I, I just said the. Cluster in the cluster, the set H1 rich run pressure strip the galaxies, uh, they can be affected from a very large distance. They have a, a known time to be affected by run pressure if the H1 gas is not stripped immediately. Uh -huh. And these two figures exactly uh, wants to show that indeed the H1 gas is not stripped immediately for the majority of those uh, set affected satellites. Right. Uh, and in, in these two panels, we can focus on the red panel, which is uh, unresolved, uh, uh, which is all the galaxies uh, identified, quantified with the unresolved method, the Azimuth or ASMP or R1 MS method, because this is the more statistically more representative for the whole sample. Um, the left panel is for the resolved image-based method, 
that is only used there as a reference, as a comparison. So if we focus on the bottom right panel, we plot the H1 mass as a function of stellar mass, which is the red dots for those RPS Rampage affected galaxies. Okay. And, and then we plot the stars, which is the post Rampage stripping status and using the dotted line to connect the two stages of the of each galaxy. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah the, the post RPS status is simply quantified as uh, subtracting from the current H1 mass, the strippable H1 mass. Got so, it, got it, got yeah. it. So we assume after a period of time, those strippable H1, they, they are fully stripped, uh -huh. then how much H1 gas is left. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, if the period to strip the strippable H1 is very short, uh, this gives us an idea uh, how, how fast, how, how depleted the galaxy will become after uh, experiencing uh, the current level of stripping. Mm -hmm. uh, and the impression we immediately get is that for some of the uh, dotted lines, they, they go below the figure range, they, the H1 mass dropped uh, significantly. Yeah. But, uh, hmm. but for many of them, uh, the stars compared to the red dots, they did not drop very far. They drop a few, point, a few times 0.1 dex. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are two curves to be compared with two key curves, one is the, uh, the pink dash line that it can be viewed as a upper envelope of H1 mass, uh, we would expect for, uh, uh, for a given stellar mass. That curve was based on the alpha alpha, uh, a relatively shallow but, uh, uh, but a wide survey of galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, it detected only the H1 rich sample because of shallowness, but it uh, a robustly determines the upper envelope of H1 distribution, mass distribution at a given stellar mass. Mm -hmm. So we can use distance of a galaxy from the, uh, the pink dash line as a measure of how far they, they are from the H1 rich sequence mm -hmm. as a measure of their richness. Mm -hmm. uh, and another, another curve is the dotted dark green curve uh, in the relatively bottom position of the panel, mm -hmm. that is the Wallaby detection limit. Uh, yeah. We use this limit to justify after stripping the currently strippable H1 gas, whether the galaxy will still be observable. Right. Uh, if the galaxy is, um, is unobservable after stripping the current strippable gas, then our scenario has a problem it would mean that the galaxies, when they suffer from rampart stripping, they will immediately below the detection limit right. if the, uh, if the uh, stripping time period is short. Uh, and then Wallaby would not be very useful uh, for studying uh, the rampart stripping or even gas-rich galaxies. Right. Uh, yeah, I, would, I need to add that, that the Wallaby depth is similar to alpha-alpha, but the, here the the, the pink line, pink curve is much higher than most of our detected galaxies because the whole alpha alpha extended to a much larger volume to 200 megaparsec. While here for hydrogen, we are at a 50 megaparsec, much closer. So going to detect fainter galaxies. So uh, here we use these two curves to, to use a wallaby detection limit to demonstrate that um, after stripping the currently strippable H1, uh, the many galaxies, two thirds of them, will still be above the Wallaby detection limit. And although it's a relatively shallow survey, it's sufficient to study the, the, the run pressure stripping for more than half of the galaxies within this hydro cluster. And comparing to the pink dashed line, dashed curve, we show that uh, for many of these galaxies, uh, they, after stripping the strippable gas, the currently strippable gas, they are still relatively close to the pink line because mm -hmm. they only drop by around 0.1 dex. Mm -hmm. They can still be regarded as gas rich. Yes. The, the current level of rampant stripping 
experienced by the majority of the galaxies here, uh, they are relatively gentle, re relatively mild. Okay. Uh, and uh, we are going to see this more clearly in figure six in two histograms. Uh, the, the histogram says the same thing, but uh, show it in a clearer, clearer way because in the right now in figure five, a lot of galaxies, the post run pressure stripping status drop below the display range of that figure. Mm -hmm. So here in, uh, in panel A, we demonstrated the the run pressure stripping fraction, the fraction of strippable gas distribution, uh, and uh, we say eighty over eighty percent of them uh, is has a level be, below zero point nine dex. Zero uh, point oh sorry ninety percent ninety percent, and the ninety percent uh, the after stripping ninety percent of the gas, the 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 gas the gas level will be one dex lower. Uh, than, than, than the current level, because it will be 10% over the current level. Uh, and that will, so when the level, when the FRPS is above 0.9, it's a significant stripping. When it is below that, uh, it, it is a relatively mild stripping. And we can see the distribution when it is below 0.9, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is actually uh, quite a lot of them have levels much lower than 0.9. Quite a lot of them has a strippable fraction uh, mm. much lower than 0.6 and uh, 0.7. And uh, that will correspond to uh, a few times uh, like 0.5 times 0.5 dex, 0.7 dex dropping in the H1 mass. Okay. And on the right panel, you demonstrate how far uh, the post run pressure stripping status would go uh, uh, with respect to the uh, alpha alpha relation, the pink curve we showed right now. Uh -huh. So we see the two thirds, around two thirds to half of the galaxies, they will still remain near the alpha alpha upper limit, uh, upper envelope, and only one third of them is a is strongly is significantly below that. Uh -huh. So it shows the, exactly the same thing we just showed now. So uh, up to now, we have uh, we have said that we have shown that the run pressure stripping they can happen very early beyond the viral radius. Uh, the 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 stripping level can be very mild, and if the stripping time scale uh, is very short, that would suggest that the uh, the run pressure stripping um, could uh, uh, the current level stripping will not significantly uh, affect the uh, the H one gas of a galaxy. Uh, immediately, and it can suffering from run pressure stripping for quite a long time, and that will be uh, and this assumption about the time scale will be investigated uh, in the next figure in the next uh, section uh, when we use the uh, resolved galaxies uh, to demonstrate how uh, how the galaxy would uh, potentially uh, experience the run pressure stripping during the info. Okay. So now we can move to figure seven. Okay, yeah, there's the time, discussion of the time, a couple of time scales there in equation five, and figure seven, we've got some yes. fraction stripped. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And here we used uh, uh, the, the resolved sample of the galaxy, and we, we do our experiments. Uh, we, we pretend to move the galaxy to closer. Uh, distance to the cluster center, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, by doing so, well, by moving to a closer distance to the cluster center, they will be under a uh, higher density of the intercluster median, mm -hmm. and uh, we also assume uh, acceleration of the of the galaxy, assuming the same acceleration curve as the uh, projection uh, average the escape curve of the cluster. So to reflect that they gain some velocities, get accelerated during the info. So, so with higher velocity uh, and also with a higher uh, intercluster median density, they suffering from a stronger run pressure level and their anchoring force must be able to retain that gas 
uh, and they they going to lose gas uh, in the inner radius than 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 at a larger cluster centric distance. Mm -hmm. So by doing so. Uh, a way we can draw the curve of expected uh, uh, strippable fraction of the H1 over total H1 mass as a function of distance, projected dis distance to the cluster center. Uh, and the, the top panel is the, is the currently uh, the, 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 uh, the, the identified run pressure stripping candidates. The bottom panel is the, the galaxies not identified to be suffering from run pressure stripping at the moment. Um, and uh, because we put them at, uh, at, at the pretended distances, the currently unstripped galaxies, they are going to be stripped in the future when they get closer to the cluster center. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the top panel, we also use the dots to mark the current position, the current uh, distance from the cluster center okay. and the current level of FRPS they really have for each of the run pressure stripping candidates. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, by construction, they are in the curve. Right. And now uh, we also draw two uh, dash the gray curves. One is at the o point, uh, minus o, one point, the minus one level. That, oh, sorry, oh, the, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, minus one, sorry. Uh, that is the minus one level, that is the, the level for us to identify the galaxy to be around pair stripping candidates, okay. the 10% level of RPS, 10% yeah. uh, strippable gas. And the other level the, is the minus 0.1 level. Yeah, the one. Yeah, the, the upper the upper oh, one, yeah, the gray curve. Now yeah. that's what I was, yeah. The, the, the higher level of the dash the curve of the data curve is a open a 75 level, uh, 75 percent uh, of the strippable H1 uh, among the total H1 mass. That curve would uh, mark a curve where uh, a, a significant fraction of the H1 gas is stripped. So these two uh, two lines, two dash lines, they uh, they each mark the the onset of stripping. Uh -huh. And the uh, this uh, significant stage, a very late stage of stripping, where most of the gas can be stripped, can be stripped. Mm -hmm. And then, if in the top panel, if we compare the position of the dots with the with the lower dot with the lower dash the nine, uh, with the onset of the stripping, uh, and then we get a mm -hmm. we can get a distance. Uh, uh, get a projected distance right. uh, between the the dots and the uh, where the curve intersect with the gray dashed line. Uh -huh. So yeah. that distance uh, means that uh, from the dashed line, some of the currently observable H1 can already start can already be stripped uh, at that time at that uh, dashed level time, but. Uh, uh, we can still observe now, observe those type of H1 now because the stripping is not a, a immediate instant, instantaneous process. It right. takes time for the run pressure to accelerate H1 clouds uh, and to, to get it far enough above the disk, either get out of the viral radius of the disk, get, a, get enough velocity to escape from the potential well of the galaxy, or get accelerated and stay enough time in the hot gas halo of the disk and of the surrounding uh, intercluster medium so that the cloud can get evaporated okay. within the very high temperature 10 to 6 Kelvin there. Right. Uh, so uh, so this, uh, this distance between the dots and the intersect points of the bottom of the lower dash line, it can be viewed as a measure, uh, as an upper limit of the time scale needed to strip a uh, currently strippable H1 gas. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we can, uh, we, we, we if we quantified the majority of the galaxies, the ten, uh, the eight out of the ten here, they have such a distance lower than 0 0.1 uh, times R two hundred, um, and that distance 
take less than um, 200 minutes for a galaxy to travel through uh, if it is, has the speed of the uh, velocity dispersion of the cluster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, by doing so, we we prove that the for for the ma majority of the galaxies to strip in to strip the currently stripable H one, the time scale is uh, relatively short, and it should be less than two hundred million years. Mm -hmm. There are a few curves uh, that exceed uh, exceed zero point one uh, uh, with a, that distance exceed zero point one two hundred uh, two hundred exceed two hundred million years. And for those two galaxies, uh, they, it is they have very extended H one disk. Mm. Uh, there would be uh, projection uh, uh, projection uncertainties of the method because we only have projected distance project and only have the uh, have have the radial velocity, and there could also be some other effects that are adding to the H one of the disk at the, in in the recent past. Like um, the minor merger of the satellite that build uh, the H1 disk, and so that the it divide from the stripping history of most other galaxies. Oh, right, and an event. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, another time scale we can draw from this curve uh, is from uh, the the open uh, the from the either two intersect points. Uh, between the two, uh, between the lower dashed line and the top dashed line. Okay. So the, the distance between the two intersects, uh, it mark a uh, distance a galaxy would travel uh, uh, to, between the onset of run pressure stripping yes. and uh, the, the, the stage where the majority of the H1 get stripped. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. And and uh, we're using a criteria of 0 0.3 uh, R200 to distinguish these two types of curves, a shallow curve and a steep curve. For a steep curve, uh, the time scale, the, the, the distance need at least to travel before losing its current level of H1 is less than 0 0.3 uh, R200. That's around 600 million years for the galaxy to travel through. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the shallow curves, for the green curves, it needs more than 600 million years to travel through. That will be a, a slow stripping. So the, the greens are the slow stripping and mm -hmm. the, the, the yellow ones are the fast stripping. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can see uh, for, the, for the galaxies, the, the, the resolved galaxies currently under stripping and the, some of them have experiencing a fast stripping, but many of them are slow stripping. And if we look at the bottom, curve, bottom panel, including those galaxies that are currently um, not experiencing run pressure stripping, but going to experience run pressure stripping in the future, uh, the majority of them will start with a weak run pressure stripping. We see much fewer weak, uh, we see much fewer slow run pressure stripping uh, in the bottom panel than in the bottom, than in, in the top panel than in the bottom panel, right. uh, because for a galaxy to be uh, identified as a run pressure stripping galaxies, uh, it must, uh, it is likely the 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 run pressure stripping has started some time ago uh, than what we than, than we observe now but the, so so the, unre, the so in the bottom panel the galaxies that are currently not experiencing uh, run pressure stripping uh, they make a better uh, more complete story of uh, how a galaxy would experience the run pressure stripping and mm -hmm. we can see the majority of them they will have a very long time to be under run pressure stripping um, um, over 600 million years, and many of them can exceed one giga year. Okay, yeah, some of these are all slow ones, yeah. Okay. And yeah. cool. uh, so from these two figures, we draw the two, two conclusions about the time scale, that is to strip the currently strippable H1 gas, and uh, the time scale is quite short, but for a galaxy to be 
uh, run out of most of its gas because of purely because of run pressure stripping, uh, the time scale can be quite long uh, because the stripping level uh, is not very high. The F FRPS is not very high. Right. Uh, and, uh, and now we can go to figure eight and to, to physically understand why we observe this uh, different properties of the run pressure stripping. Uh, uh, this, this is figure eight, but the figure eight uh, roughly confirmed our estimated run pressure stripping time scale earlier. This is the time scale of to strip the strippable H1. Uh, we consider two scenarios. In one scenario, we consider the stripping run pressure is strong enough that the uh, the cloud, the strippable cloud, quickly uh, get to the escape velocity mm -hmm. within the potential of the galaxy. Uh, so that is estimated as a tau escape. And in a second scenario, we think the acceleration is very, level is very low, run pressure is very low. So the, galaxy, the cloud rises slowly above the disk and then it does not have enough time to reach the escape velocity and get evaporated before being accelerated enough. So the stripping time scale is estimated as uh, the time the cloud need to rise a distance above the disk mm -hmm. and the time need for the cloud to be evaporated within the hot interstellar me intercluster media. Uh, and uh, the typically uh, because of the, the hydrogen, the, the temperature 10 to six is very high the evaporation time scale is much shorter uh, than, than, the, the, than the time scale of galaxy lead to, to travel uh, distance uh, rising above the disk. Uh, and uh, so, so these two scenarios, the tau escape is the time scale we would prefer for the strong run pressure stripping case. And the tau rise plus tau evaporation is a time scale we would prefer for a slow, slow stripping case where the cloud will not reach the escape velocity. And we will use the lesser, the lower of the two scale as an estimate of the run pressure stripping time scale. Uh, so the, whatever makes the cloud disappear faster would be estimated, will be considered as the stripping time scale. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the dashed the gray dashed curve mark the, the, the nine of unity uh, x equal y. So for the majority of the galaxies, uh, the, we find the, the, the weak stripping time scale is much shorter. So you'd prefer the, the scenario where the galaxies, they, the, the, they, they only have the cloud stripped uh, um, uh, very, uh, very slowly and the cloud does not reach the escape velocity before it is evaporated in the SM. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the time scale uh, uh, estimated as the, the weak scenario in this weak scenario, typically less than uh, 300 million years, uh, a few hundred million years, consistent with what we have just estimated from the curve of experimental FRPS. Good. Yeah, uh, and then now we can go to the next uh, figure, figure nine. That should be the summarizing uh, yeah. figure of all those results. Okay. Uh, so basically, up to now, we have observed a uh, uh, diversity of run pressure stripping uh, effects uh, in the cluster. The diversity we mean that uh, it can start in a very wide range of and uh, deep projection from the cluster center. Okay. That means there's a large variation of time uh, that the run pressure stripping start in a galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can start from uh, uh, 1.2 times the wave radius. That's the uh, first uh, diversity that's in starting time, on setting time. And the second diversity we have observed is uh, the, the, the large spread in the level of FRPS the run pressure stripping level, the fraction of strippable H1 gas over the total H1 gas. Oh, so that cool. is uh, uh, how, how much H1 will be uh, affected. 
uh, and the third diversity we observe is the, the speed that the galaxy is going to lose its current level, current amount of H1, if purely due to Rampage stripping. And we observe uh, a quite a, a, a different slope in the curve of FRPS as a function of projected distance, mm -hmm. meaning that the stripping time for the galaxies uh, would ranging from uh, less than 200 million years to over one giga years. Yes. So they, 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 there can be, they can be early uh, and strong and uh, uh, there can be early strong and quick stripping that remove the gas very, uh, very efficiently and that could be late and weak and, uh, uh, and uh, slow stripping that re remove the gas very inefficiently. Uh, and uh, uh, these two figures explains why we can observe such a uh, diversity. Uh, the diversity uh, we observe there because for the, the run pressure level, uh, uh, when we estimate the run pressure stripping um, properties, we depend on two physical quantity. One is the run pressure level, the other is the anchoring force level. For the run pressure uh, level, uh, it depends strongly on the intercluster median density. And when the galaxy travel from the uh, outside of the cluster to, to the cluster in a region, the intercluster median density rise very slowly um, from 2.5 to, uh, to, 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 from 2.5 to one times the river radius. The, uh, it's a distance of 1.5 the river radius but the run, per, the, the run pressure level only increases by two orders of uh, magnitude. Right. But if we consider uh, a traveling from an 0.5 uh, R200 to, to the very center, then within this distance of 0.5, half the river radius, uh, the, the interstellar median density level rises four orders of magnitude. Yes. So, it's a very shallow profile in the outer region and a very quick increase toward the center. Yes. This already indicated that if a galaxy, they, ex they start their run pressure uh, early, they can be under very low level run pressure for quite a long time of travel. Mm -hmm. And particularly when we consider the effect, the galaxy has ha have lower velocity during the early infall and got accelerated later. So this extract this makes the uh, the 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 longer long time stay in the low run pressure level even more extreme. Uh, and uh, the other thing we consider uh, the, the, the anchoring force. And when we took a look at the anchoring force, the galaxy H1 profiles, the H1 density distribution, they extend quite far compared to the to the optical radius, quantified as R90. R band here, that oh. is the radius enclosing 90% of the optical light. Ah, okay, so light radius, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, for many, most of these detected H1 rich galaxies that is informing for the first time, suffering from run pressure stripping of the hydro cluster, suffering so strong run pressure stripping for the first time, that H1 uh, is extended, very extended, and having a very low substantiality beyond the optical radius. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that a very extended disk, we lead a very low level uh, with the unit drawing this figure, we only need the F, F anchoring force to reach minus one dex for the run pressure to, to, to onset for the majority of these galaxies. Mm -hmm. And to have that level of anchoring, to have run pressure level, exceed that level anchoring force, the galaxy only needs to be to sit at a distance of uh, between one op one between one and one point five times R200. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically we're comparing anchoring force level in the bottom to the to the run pressure level in the top. So right. to strip to strip the outermost uh, disk, the, the, the run pressure level leaded is not very high. It's a level between, uh, it, it, that level is, uh, it, the run pressure level is started to be enough from close to the wavelength radius of the cluster. 
uh, but then when we if we want to affect uh, the 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 h1 within the optical radius then the, where the anchoring force uh, start to be above uh, zero dex or minus 0.5 dex then the we need the room pressure level to be uh, need the galaxy to travel close to 0.5 the wave radius yep. of the cluster mm -hmm. and uh, finally to fully strip the h1 in the cluster or uh, in the galaxy uh, the, the anchoring force needs to rise uh, uh, the the run pressure needed to rise above the typical anchoring force 0.5 uh, 0.5 dex mm -hmm. uh, and then we needed to uh, to to the galaxy to get really close to the cluster center close to uh, around the 0.25 uh, the wave radius of the cluster okay. so and then because this uh, ICM density run pressure level rest slowly in the outer cluster, rest deeply in the inner cluster. Well, mm -hmm. because the anchoring force level of the within the galaxy rests very slowly uh, from the very outskirts of the H1 disk to the very inner region. So we have the H1 of the galaxy slowly eaten uh, by the environmental effects of run pressure uh, right. during the infall. Uh, and uh, you, you can, the, the galaxy can stay gas rich and um, affected by run pressure stripping during quite a long time info and only get depleted when he's getting very close to the cluster center. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's, a, that's a major reason for all the properties we, we, we observe uh, for, uh, for, the, for, for the sample in this cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, another scientific uh, uh, indication for galaxy evolution, I think, is that um, for galaxies to for satellite galaxies e evolving in clusters, uh, in groups, uh, they were well. It was known in the literature. There's quite a large scatter of the time needed uh, to 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 quench the star formation of a galaxy before we didn't have much H1 data, but we have a lot of optical data to know the star formation history. Uh, it was known that the time needed to quench the star formation, uh, the, the, that has quite a large scatter. And uh, some of them to quench the star formation very early, uh, very quick within, uh, within a few hundred million years. Some other galaxies, they quench the star formation rate very slowly uh, over a period of like four giga years. Uh, that's a very different time scales. And the uh, previous studies, they tend to use uh, two very different uh, scenarios to explain the two ends of the time scale. Uh, for the very uh, short end of the time scale, they tend to use the run pressure stripping. Uh, that's a strong run pressure stripping when the galaxy they reaches very center region of the cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for the very slow type of quenching, and uh, people were using the strangulation where the run pressure strip the hot gas halo of a galaxy, but not the cool gas, not the cool interstellar media. Um, by, by stripping the hot gas halo of a galaxy, they shutting down the fueling, the replenishment for the cold interstellar media in a galaxy. Okay. And the cold interstellar media as SH1, it is a reservoir for star formation of, of a galaxy. Uh, so in these two, uh, these are two extreme ends of the of the of, of scenarios of the of the time scale uh, to quench star formation in the galaxy, and in this study we we highlighted the 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 weak uh, the the non times non term uh, weak run pressure stripping that can accompany the galaxy uh, for a long time during the info, and each time each instantaneous time only. And only eat a bit, a small bit of the H1. Uh, so uh, by doing so, we um, we seem to add an intermediate uh, phase to 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 the, those two scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, such a phase, uh, it should be less as we as quantified and by definition, it should be weaker than the very stripping, very strong stripping in the cluster center, uh, but it is stronger. Than the, than the traditional strangulation picture where only the hot gas halo is stripped 
although both the hard gas halo and uh, those uh, extended H1 reservoir beyond optical radius, they both serve as a, a reservoir material for star formation. Uh, thus, this extended H1 and it's a closer step to star formation than the hot, inter hot, uh, CGM, hot CGM around the galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, that if they, we add this weak ramp pressure stripping within the environmental processing, uh, they, they, if we can quantify it um, in a more clear way, in a, uh, in, uh, in, with better statistics in the future, with larger samples and combining them with some analytical models, with hydrodynamic models, right. uh, better quantify the process, potentially they will result in a, a stronger environmental effects uh, than, uh, than only considering the strong run pressure stripping and the uh, strangulation due to removal of the hot gas halo, and then leave uh, less space for internal feedback uh, of a galaxy to play in depleting the gas in quenching the star formation. Yes. Uh, and one and we one of the problem in in galaxy evolution cosmological simulation of galaxy evolution uh, is that uh, in order to reproduce many of the observed properties well, scaling relations, mass functions well, they has to have a, a very strong feedback. Uh, the, particularly the stellar feedback to to account for the no mass end of the mass function stellar mass function of galaxies, but when adding the uh, stellar feedback, uh, one of the thing uh, is that the the the, the efficiency of feeding back and the energy efficiency is very high, much higher than one would uh, theoretically expect from a stellar window or supernova feedback. Okay. So. In other words, the feedback to be seems to be too strong, and and if we would have stronger environmental effects, this would at least mitigate that problem for the satellite galaxies info in the cluster. Mm -hmm. So that's a that, that's an implication of our results for the galaxy evolution, uh, particularly in cluster environment. Very cool. Very cool. Jing, I want to thank you so much for walking us through this really lovely article. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so you mentioned it a, a couple, you, you hinted at it a couple times and it was there at the end in your conclusions. Um, so so where do we go in, in the future, let's say over the next five years? Uh, the title said this was a Wallaby pilot. So presumably there will be um, non-pilot studies from Wallaby. Um, so, so where, where do we go over the next, uh, let's say, five years to um, improve the current situation? Uh, firstly, we are now in the phase of pilot two. Uh, in pilot two, we are going to observe another massive group that near the hydro cluster is to the, uh, to the east northern side of the hydro cluster. Uh, you say something, uh, and uh, that, that will be around uh, another 100 square degree of, of observation while covering quite a wide uh, cosmological large, sc large scale structure uh, mm -hmm. in the nearby universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, 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 the whole wallaby, uh, the standard wallaby, uh, I mean, after pilot survey, uh, will start, uh, should officially start at least uh, uh, from the next year. So uh, basically, we are going to observe many, many clusters covering, uh, realize our, our dream to cover at least uh, one half of the whole sky, uh, hopefully two thirds of the whole sky. And then we're going to have much better statistics. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we do, as, a, as a Swallaby survey, the ASCAP survey, the Pathfinder uh, for SKA, in the future, we're going to use SK to, to increase the res resolution, spatial resolution, and get uh, more galaxies resolved instead of having uh, a, a most only uh, average method to quantify the different effects. OK, cool. I think there's going to be a lot of action in this field over the next five, 10 years. So it'd be really nice to um, see this move forward coming in the literature. So. Yeah. 
Alrighty, thank you once again, Jing, and thank you everyone for tuning in, and I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Frank.